Coming up on Bridge City News, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau announces that the emergency wage subsidy program will be extended as national unemployment numbers hit record highs. Lethbridge police have handed over the service investigation involving a stormtrooper to an external source. And today marks the 75th anniversary of the Allied forces celebrating Nazi Germany's surrender during the Second World War. Your nation. Your province. Your southern Alberta. From the heart of Lethbridge, it's Bridge City News with Hal Roberts. Thanks so much for joining us. Lethbridge police have handed over the service investigation of the stormtrooper takedown to the Medicine Hat Police. Lethbridge Police Chief Scott Woods says the Director of Law Enforcement determined that the matter was not best suited for the Alberta Serious Incident Response Team, so the Medicine Hat Police have been contacted and brought in. In a story that made international headlines last Monday around 11 a.m., Lethbridge Police were called to a Star Wars-themed restaurant after receiving reports that someone was carrying a firearm. Upon arrival, they found an employee dressed in a stormtrooper outfit carrying a fake gun. The 19-year-old female sustained a minor injury in the altercation with police. The province announced today that it will be giving $147 million to support communities in the north, including Fort McMurray, which have been affected by devastating floods this spring. Premier Jason Kenney says the funds will help communities to recover and rebuild. This is on top of nearly $8 million in emergency flood uh, payments that have been provided so far to 7,500 evacuees to help cover food and shelter costs after they were forced out of their homes. So that's a $147 million from the Disaster Res Resistance Program for the communities in the north affected by these spring ice jams and floods. The Canadian Red Cross is also helping out families affected by flooding in the north. They're providing $600 for every household in Fort McMurray that was forced to evacuate due to recent flooding. Officials with the Red Cross say the funds will help families with the re-entry needs, which may include food, laundry supplies and transportation. Alberta Premier Jason Kenney took a couple of recent shots at Green Party leader Elizabeth May and Bloc Québécois leader Yves Francois Blanchet, who said Canada should move beyond oil sands in the post-pandemic world. Please stop kicking us while we're down. We Albertans have been generous and we will continue to be generous. They enjoy the benefits of living in a modern industrial economy which is predicated on access to affordable energy much of which, half of which for Quebec, comes from Alberta. And if it didn't come from here, it would be coming instead from the United States and from OPEC dictatorships. Mr. Blanchet said that um, Albert, Albertans have been sending, quotes, a string of insults to Quebec. Nothing could be further from the truth. What we have sent instead is tens of billions of dollars of wealth generated by the hard work of Albertans, including tens of thousands of Quebecers who moved to this province to participate in our energy industry. An inmate at a Calgary correctional facility has tested positive for COVID-19. Government officials say it is the first case of someone in corrections who has the coronavirus. Alberta Chief Medical Officer of Health, Dr. Dean Henshaw, says this person and a cellmate have been admitted to a quarantine unit. Henshaw says when the first inmate arrived, he was feeling fine. The individual reported feeling unwell the following evening, at which time both he and his cellmate were placed in isolation and the symptomatic individual was swabbed. All inmates are assessed for exposure and symptoms upon admission to the facility or transfer from another location. Dr. Henshaw says 4,020 people have now recovered from the coronavirus in our province. There are still 1,963 active cases. There were 81 new cases today. There are also currently 1,133 confirmed cases here in the South Zone. Six people are still in hospital and there have been six deaths. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau says the government's emergency wage subsidy program will be extended beyond the early June endpoint. The program covers 75% of worker pay up to $847 a week to try and help employers in the face of steep declines due to the pandemic. The Canadian economy lost almost 2 million jobs in April, which was a record high. The loss comes on top of more than a million jobs lost in March and millions more having their hours and income slashed. Stats Canada says the unemployment rate soared to 13% as the full force of the pandemic hit compared with the 7.8% in March. Prime Minister Trudeau says the coronavirus pandemic's disproportionate effect on the employment of women and those who are marginalized will have implications for how the government tries to repair the economic damage. This is um, one of the first recessions uh, uh, we've ever seen that has so hard hit 
uh, vulnerable workers in the service sector, particularly uh, women and new Canadians uh, and young people. And that was uh, evident in the, in the uh, March numbers and continues to be the case in the April numbers. What we're seeing uh, even beyond these reports and these numbers is uh, the reality on the ground that people who are already uh, vulnerable in the workforce, people who are already uh, disadvantaged or facing extra barriers uh, are always the first to get hit when uh, we have a difficult situation like this. Alberta's unemployment rate in April was one of the highest in the country due to the COVID-19 pandemic as the slow spread of the virus forced non-essential businesses to close. New numbers from Stats Canada shows the jobless rate spiked to 13.4% for March's figure of 8.7%. Only Quebec and Newfoundland had higher rates of 17 and 16 percent. April marked the second month in a row that employment rates declined in all provinces. The city of Lethbridge announced more temporary layoffs due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Officials say the reductions are related to the delivery of recreational and cultural services since many of city Lethbridge buildings remain closed. In a release, the city says there are still no reopening dates for the NMAC Centre, city arenas and pools. Therefore, 30 staff will be laid off. The latest reduction brings the total number of jobs lost temporarily to 301. Museums in Alberta are able to open up starting May 14th, and the Galt Museum and Archives is one of the businesses in Lethbridge that is included in the province's relaunch strategy. Now, Micah Quinn is outside of the Galt Museum and has more on when the museum is planning on reopening. The Galt Museum and Archives have been closed to the public due to COVID-19 for almost two months now, but they are planning on reopening for a tentative date of June 1st, the CEO of the Galt, Darren Martins, says that May 14th was too early to reopen and still feels safe about allowing customers back inside. What uh, myself and the team here at the Galt uh, Museum and Archives and the Fort uh, has looked at those timelines and we believe it's in our public's interest as well as the interest of the safety of our staff uh, to open not on that date, but rather a little bit later, and we are looking at June the 1st. The Galt wants to make sure that they can reopen in a safe way and ensure that with the extra two weeks, they have the proper procedures in place. Martins says the Galt will be instituting PPE for workers as well, and if customers want to wear a mask when they come in, they can. For Bridge City News, I'm Micah Quinn. Layoffs by companies are affecting many North Americans. Scott Warwick lost his job of five years due to the COVID-19 pandemic. He says times are tough right now, especially since he and his wife are expecting their first child. Okay. Due to the COVID, we have been uh, having facilities shut down due to patient volumes decreasing. And uh, when, when that happens, since I'm a facilities guy and there's not as many facilities to manage, um, we got down to just one. Um, They're like, you know, we're having to cut back costs and everything, so they were letting me go um, at that time. You know, not having the, the financial income, and you know, obviously makes things uh, troublesome with student loans and mortgage and uh, all sorts of bills. So trying to fight through that is, uh, you know, making it tough right now. But going through unemployment, hopefully that will help um, stay the ship for a little bit. My uh, my wife is pregnant with our, our first child, and we're you know expecting in August. So with all this hitting um, and, you know, not having the income uh, from the job and um, the ability to not really have, you know, family and friends around, you know, we're obviously concerned about, you know, payment, you know, being able to afford having a child, but also whenever the, or when the child does come, um, you know, his family can be able to come, you know, visit and see, uh, we've heard stories of fathers not being allowed in the delivery room. The economic impacts of COVID-19 have been widespread to the agriculture sector. More Albertans are speaking out about Ottawa's $252 million aid package to farmers and producers. Lethbridge County Reeve Lauren Hickey says that a larger sum of closer to $3 billion would have been a lot more helpful for the ag sector. If you look at uh, especially the cattle feeding industry in, uh, in the Lethbridge County, I mean, uh, almost 61% of the beef for uh, of all of Canada comes from Lethbridge County. So there's a huge number trade along there. So we're well over a billion dollars in gross sales there alone. We, we sort of need to get that economy back rolling again, and uh, there, there has to be a safe way to do it. Hickey says Lethbridge County will continue to lobby governments to support the agriculture industry as much as possible. 
The Western Hockey League announced today that Lethbridge Hurricanes GM Peter Anholt is this year's recipient of the Lloyd Saunders Memorial Trophy as the WHL's Executive of the Year. Anholt has been the Canes GM for the past six seasons. I think the word respect is really important for our organization. I, I think that, you know, you don't gain respect quickly and get respect quickly. I think it takes time. And I think now, you know, that we've, we've kind of gone about our business, uh, you know, I think in the right way over the last number of years, we've had some good teams. Our, our business model has continued to grow and get better and better. And so that to me is a big, big part of this whole process. In the 2019-2020 shortened season, the Canes collected a record of 37-19-2-5 in 63 games, finishing third in the Central Division in the Eastern Conference. Over the past five seasons, the Canes have had a record of 200-115-18-14 to lead all Eastern Conference teams in regular season victories in that span. In a surprise twist, the Lethbridge College Kodiaks did not have to look far to find another coach for this women's basketball team. It turns out Deanna Simpson, the reigning ACAC South Division Coach of the Year, who previously announced her resignation, will be back. Simpson will be joined by Ken McMurray as co-coaches for the upcoming season. Simpson spent the past three seasons as head coach of the Kodiaks women's team, making the ACAC playoffs in each of the past two seasons. Mother's Day is just two days away now. Bridge City News hit the streets and asked kids in our community what they think of their moms ahead of Mother's Day. As video journalist Loris Alexander discovered, the answers were simply adorable. Some kids know exactly what to say about mom. This is gratitude at its finest. My mom means everything to me because she made me alive. She, um, even though I get hurt, she helps me up and she tells me never to give up. She gave me this room. She gives me food and she does everything for me. So. But Ace here is a man of few words. Mom, love you. I love my mom. I love you. Charisma loves her mom for salvaging her haircut when she decided to take the fate of her hair in her own hands. I asked my mom if she could cut my hair. And she was, I didn't know that she was going to cut my hair, but I cut my hair. We caught up with Ace on his route to work. Does your mom know how to dance? No. I don't think we got that. Let's hear it again. No, no, no. So from all the baby sharks to the mommy sharks, happy Mother's Day. For Bridge City News, I'm Loris Alexander. There's a group in Canada which helps to provide breast milk for families and babies in need. BCN's Ainsley O'Reilly spoke with one man who's advocating for single fathers like himself who needs the precious commodity for his baby. Single father Nathan Chan, founder of Breast Milk Hero, has relied on a community of women to feed his little girl. He says feeding his daughter was a time of bonding. Every time I feed this milk to my daughter, I know that this represents love because the fact that she's here, she's born through surrogates, surrogacy. She's, um, you know, now it's not just surrogates, it's also like the women around me and the people who don't know me even, who are giving me something that I just cannot possibly produce. It was great to be able to use all of this breast milk that would have ended up in the garbage or trying to find people to use it, to give it to somebody who was so in need of it and who was so wanting of it. With a shortage of breast milk for so many, Chan is campaigning for more women to join the network he's created. We were so blessed to have people that donated to us, not just within my own city in Calgary. They've made the drive from Grand Prairie. We've had people from Lethbridge. Um, we've had people from different provinces like Saskatchewan, BC, and also in Ontario and New Brunswick. With Mother's Day coming up this Sunday, the special day can mean so much for so many. I get to celebrate Mother's Day because I also play the role of being a mom too, but at the same time, it's me celebrating all the women in my life. If you're interested in donating, you can visit singledaddybychoice.com. For Bridge City News, I'm Ainsley O'Reilly. Amidst the coronavirus pandemic, several local companies have stepped up to help. 
One local pizza shop is doing just that. Little Caesars Pizza on the north side is giving back to frontline workers, and they told BCN it is their way of thanking those frontline workers. Little Caesars Canada uh, came out and we are giving away 250,000 slices. Uh, and we had the opportunity to be part of it and we wanted to be part of it. So in Lethbridge alone, so all of our Little Caesars stores in Lethbridge, um, we are giving away 300 pizzas uh, to our essential workers, our frontline workers, and our first responders. And there's just selected at random. The world held commemorations of the 75th anniversary of the surrender of Nazi Germany to Allied forces in low-key fashion this year due to COVID-19 restrictions. At a ceremony in Toronto, Ontario Premier Doug Ford says Canada played a pivotal role in helping to secure that victory. The victory of the Allied forces over Nazi Germany. Canada played a pivotal role in helping to secure that victory and liberate Europe from the Nazis. While we cannot mark this historic occasion together in person today, we come together in our own ways to pay tribute. It can be as simple as a moment of silence, remembering a loved one who served, or calling a veteran to thank them. Tony Vaccaro has survived an abusive childhood as an orphan during the Great Depression, the Battle of Normandy during World War II, and a potentially lethal bout with COVID-19 last month and all at the age of 97. I really feel I, I have luck on my back and I could go anywhere on this earth and survive it. To me, the greatest thing that you can do is challenge the world. I challenge. 97 years young and still going strong. Great to see. We had more moisture in parts of southwestern Alberta again today and there's some rain in the forecast for the weekend as well. Full weather details are coming up. It was slightly cooler today with spotty showers in some regions. Jeanette Roche is here now with a full look at the weather picture. Jeanette, can we expect a soggy weekend? Well, maybe for part of the weekend, Hal. Uh, as we get into tonight, we're gonna see the skies clear overnight with an overnight low of one degree. Wind gusts up to 50K per hour. And then into tomorrow morning, we'll see the sun shine early in the day and then the clouds are gonna roll in. We could see a 60% chance of showers uh, on Saturday afternoon with wind gusts up to 60K per hour. And the high tomorrow, 11 degrees, the overnight low on Saturday night, uh, minus two. And then as we get into Sunday, Mother's Day, we're gonna be seeing some sunshine there for mom on Mother's Day with a high of 8 degrees, overnight low of 1. And then into the beginning of next week, we'll see the clouds as well roll in with partly cloudy skies for Monday with a high of 10, high of 9 expected on Tuesday. Wednesday's high up to 17 and 18 degrees for next Thursday. Also with some partly cloudy skies for most of next week. And we are definitely hitting those averages for this time of year. Average 17 degrees. The overnight low average about 3 degrees. Sometimes we are a little bit lower in that range. Um, actually, Tuesday night of next week, we could actually see some frost or some flurries. But fingers crossed that that won't happen. The high temperature on this day was back in 1930. It, 1987, rather, it was 30 degrees. And the the lowest temperature was minus four. It was 1973 that that happened. The sun rose this morning at 5.56 a.m. and the sunset is set for 8.59 p.m. just before 9 p.m. giving us almost exactly 15 hours of daylight. Now let's take a look at the highs expected across the country for Saturday. Lots of sunshine on the west coast. Victoria and Vancouver's highs 25 expected for Victoria. 22 for Vancouver. Now we're gonna be seeing some showers across Alberta tomorrow, 30% in Calgary, 60% chance of showers expected tomorrow in Edmonton, a 60% chance of rain also expected in Saskatoon, a high of eight degrees, eight degrees expected for Regina as well with a mix of sun and cloud, partly cloudy skies expected in Winnipeg as well with a high of eight degrees. Now, as we get further east, we're gonna be seeing yuckier conditions, especially in Toronto. Okay, so here's what's happening. 30% chance of snow in the morning, and that's gonna climb to 70% chance by the afternoon. Uh, high of six degrees, four degrees is the high expected in Ottawa. Also, they're gonna be seeing a mix of snow and rain, slushy conditions also expected from Montreal tomorrow. Now, Fredericton, lots of rain, 10 to 20 millimeters expected. Charlottetown, five millimeters of rain expected there, high of eight degrees. Halifax, 
drizzly as well with eight is the high there. Same thing for St. John's New Finland. Lots of rain and drizzle going on on the East Coast tomorrow. There you go, that is your weather. There was some good news from the province in regards to the amount of people who have recovered from COVID-19 at meat processing facilities in Alberta. Officials say of the 944 confirmed cases at Cargill near High River, 826 have now recovered. Of the 583 cases at JBS Foods and Brooks, 466 have recovered. And 15 of the 38 have now recovered from the coronavirus at Harmony Beef in Calgary. Across the province, 3,809 of the 6,017 have now recovered from COVID-19. Our country's unemployment rate soared to 13% last month as the economy suffered a record of nearly 2 million jobs. The rate was up from 7.8% in March as thousands of businesses closed to prevent the spread of COVID-19. But the job losses were only half of the 4 million analysts had been expecting. BMO Chief Economist Doug Porter says we may have finally seen the worst of it as several provinces are moving to ease restrictions on businesses. The Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation says multi-unit housing starts were up 10.8% in most provinces despite the impact of the coronavirus. The April seasonally adjusted annualized rate, excluding Quebec, was up 16,000 to just over 166,000 units. CMHC says Quebec was left out because of the province's COVID-19 containment measures were in place until April 20th. Multiple dwelling units were up 42% in Ontario, but here in Alberta they fell 28%. Uber lost $2.8 billion in the first quarter as its overseas investments were hammered by the coronavirus pandemic. The company is looking to its growing food delivery business and aggressive cost-cutting measures to ease the pain. Earlier this week, Uber said it would be cutting 3,700 full-time workers. The company said it was offloading Jump, its bike and scooter business, to Lime, a company in which it's investing $85 million. Revenue in its East meal delivery business grew 53% as customers shuttered at home opted to order in. American oil and gas producer Murphy Oil Corporation is closing down its Calgary office to cut costs as oil prices remain low. The company and the office in Calgary employs around 110 people. The company says it will transfer that workload to an existing office in Houston. The move comes four years after Murphy agreed to sell its 5% stake in Syncrude to Suncor. Murphy says the office closure will be completed early in the third quarter of this year and will not impact field operations in Canada or the United States. Now, here's a look at today's markets. The TSX was up 132 points in the day to finish at 14,966. The Dow was up 455 to 24,331. The S&P 500 was up 48 points to 29,29. The Nasdaq was up 141 points to finish at 91,21. Oil was up $1.19 to 24,74 per barrel. Natural gas was down 7 cents to $1.83. Gold was down 13.36 to 17.02.70 an ounce. And silver was up 14 cents to 1548 an ounce. Wheat is at $234 per metric ton, barley's at $231, canola's at 466, and corn is at $230 per metric ton. Live cattle were up 68 cents to 94.65, feeder cattle were down $1.20 to 136.95, and lean hogs were down 220 to 6170. The Canadian dollar was up on the day at 7180 US. Recapping one of our top stories this hour, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau says the government's emergency wage subsidy program will be extended beyond the early June endpoint. The program covers 75% of worker pay, up to $847 a week, to try and help employers on the job in the face of steep declines due to the COVID-19 pandemic. The Canadian economy lost almost 2 million jobs in April, which was a record high. There's a group looking for volunteers for human challenge trials to help find a vaccine for COVID-19. Up next, BCN's Jeanette Rocher chats with Josh Morrison from One Day Sooner, who has all of the details. Well, most of us are really hoping someone will come along with an effective vaccine for COVID-19 really soon. But the reality is vaccines generally take about 18 months to develop. But there is possibly a faster way to do this, although it comes with some controversy. Today's guest is going to tell us what could be part of the solution. Josh Morrison is one of the team leaders with One Day Sooner. Hello, Josh. Thank you for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Mm -hmm. Now, can you give our viewers a snapshot of what One Day Sooner is all about? 
Yeah, so we're a group that advocates for people who are interested in participating in what's called a human challenge trial. And what that means is it's a way of testing a vaccine that instead of just giving someone a vaccine and letting them go out into the normal population, seeing if they'll be infected, you actually deliberately expose them to infection, and that way you can test it a lot quicker. And so that's what we're, we're interested in exploring, whether that would be a good idea. Right. Now, can you explain how the human challenge trial works? I assume that first you find candidates or volunteers, right? And some of them are given the trial vaccine while others are getting a placebo, and then others actually get the dose of COVID-19 virus. Is that correct? Yeah, no, that's, that's, that's uh, exactly right. So it's, it's exactly like a normal clinical trial. Uh, for what's called efficacy, to figure out if the vaccine works. So that's that's usually what's called phase three. Um, and usually it takes, you know, if you're trying to go really fast, maybe six or seven months, but but often more than that. And uh, it has thousands or even tens of thousands of people. And like you said, you give half the group the vaccine and half the group a placebo, or maybe another vaccine or something like that that you're testing against. With a challenge trial, it works the same way. You give both halves the vaccine and the placebo, but then you have them come to a um, sort of medical facility where they'd be isolated and given medical care. And then they they take like a, a nasal spray or, or something like that that has the virus in it and which will infect people who are unvaccinated. Um, and hopefully, you know, the idea is that the it's calculated not to give serious disease to the extent possible. Um, and hopefully what happens is the people who were vaccinated far fewer of them uh, show symptoms than people who weren't vaccinated. And that's how you test that the, the, uh, the um, vaccine works. And you can figure that out within a few weeks or a month of starting that, that exposure. Whereas for a regular trial, it might take many more months than that. That's so interesting. So once they're done with the isolation period, what kinds of testing will be done on the health of these individuals? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. So they will, they'll be remain in isolation for, for several weeks until there's, you know, they've done several tests to make sure they have no, they're, they're definitely not infectious, have no more of the virus, their health is back to normal, everything like that. So there's, there's not going to be any possibility of reinfecting the community in any way or things like that. Now, after the fact, we would expect to have kind of longer term follow up and things like that to make sure that these people are getting the best health care possible and any conditions that, that came up because of their brave acts, you know, aren't go, are going to be treated as, as well as we possibly can. Mm -hmm. So what, to what degree could this potentially speed up the timeline to get a vaccine out there? Well, you know, it's, it's hard to say. There are some experts that propose kind of replacing those traditional, quote, phase three trials, those sort of six month trials with these, which might take maybe two months or so once they're set up, although it takes some time to, to get these challenge trials ready because they wouldn't be ready today. Um, so in that world, you know, maybe you could save several months. And there is precedent for doing that where uh, the vaccine that Americans use for cholera when they're traveling abroad called Vaxcora was developed using a, a challenge trial to prove that it was effective. But I think that's a little bit unlikely that you're going to replace those trials altogether. Instead, what I think we should expect is if this works, maybe it could save maybe as much as a month of a vaccine because you would get sort of the, the information you get out of a challenge trial is very useful, but it's not perfect. It's not a perfect replacement for that phase three because the people who participate in a challenge trial are young and very healthy to minimize their risks. And they're getting the virus in an unusual artificial way from like a nasal spray. So I would say, you know, if things go well, a month could be a, a realistic goal for these challenge trials. Though some experts have proposed even longer than that, as many as, as three or more months. Right, but that's still very soon compared to the 18 months, obviously. So obviously part of this debate would be whether it's ethical to intentionally infect someone with COVID-19, right? Right. And, and that's, you know, it's, it's obviously an important question. And no one is underestimating or underplaying the risks to these volunteers. But at the same time, we think that if there are young and healthy volunteers, these risks would be around the level of childbirth or kidney donation, which are things that you know, are definitely significant risks and, and are, are real meaningful choices, but are also things we commonly allow people to do. And the benefits would be significant. So we feel like if there are willing and well-informed volunteers who want to take this risk, and it looks like there'll be a meaningful improvement 
in vaccine development. Even bringing things one day sooner, we think, would justify doing this. Yeah, and I'm sure that there's others that believe that this, in fact, might be morally required under the current circumstances, right? So you've got two schools of thought there. Yeah, I think and there's actually a paper, you know, the, the World Health Organization just issued a report, uh, I believe yesterday, that looked at these questions and, and came up with a set of criteria for how you would actually evaluate whether challenge trials would go forward. And I think, you know, there's some things I disagree with and there's some comments I made that I wish they had taken, but I think generally it's a pretty good report and it's, it's definitely something that's, I think, reasonably positive about, about challenge trials overall. And there's actually another piece coming out today um, by a number of bioethicists in the journal Science about challenge trials that's also fairly supportive. So I do think from an ethical perspective, um, there's a decent amount of support for this. I will say that, you know, practically, it's going to be, you know, there are some difficulties in actually creating these challenge trials, and it's going to take some time. And that's why we need to be doing everything we can today to be preparing these challenge trials um, so that if we are going to use them in six months, they're ready and available mm -hmm. to be used. Now, if the human challenge trials aren't allowed to move forward, I guess we have to ask the question, how many lives could be lost because of the delay, either from COVID-19 or deaths from the effects of isolation and delayed surgeries? Yeah, so, I mean, you know, it's obviously very uncertain, you know, what, what things are going to, uh, the world's going to bring in three months or six months or especially, you know, 18 months when a vaccine might, might be, you know, kind of actively being deployed. And so anything that we can say is, is sort of a guess. Um, and I also, again, we'll just say that, you know, there's a world in which challenge trials uh, shouldn't move forward because they won't, won't work, right? And that's, that is a possibility. Um, and so we, we do have to recognize that. But that said, um, you know, if you think about one, what does one day of vaccine deployment mean, you know, one very, very rough estimate I use is I say, well, let's say that one out of six people in the world are going to get infected with COVID-19 every year. And let's say that a vaccine could save uh, let's just say 0.2% of those people from, from dying, right? So, so one in 500 of those people from dying. That would save about 7,000 lives per day um, and tens of thousands of lives per week, hundreds of thousands per month. So obviously that's an enormous effect. And that's why we need to do everything we can to prepare these and make sure they're available if they're going to be wow. a good option. Now, I'm curious, how many candidates do you have at this point, and do you have any idea as to when the government will give the okay for these trials to start? So um, we've actually had as many as 14,000, more than 14,000 people sign up um, on our website who are interested in doing this. And they've come, it's, it's really a global uh, effort. It's people have come from more than 100 countries. Um, and I will say that, that the United States has uh, a number of volunteers, more than uh, 4,500 last we checked, but actually is only number two uh, in the world. So Brazil has over 6,500 volunteers. Um, so it's been re really incredible. Now, to your question about when the government might do this, this is something we're, we're working on. We've been talking to people at the NIH, and we've been talking to Congressman uh, Bill Foster um, who's a champion of this and is a scientist himself. Um, and so we're trying to secure funding in the next stimulus bill to pay for this preparation so it can move forward as quickly as wow. possible. Wow. And now what kinds of people are volunteering? I'm just so curious about them. What, what age groups do you have and what are their backgrounds? Yep. And so I'll say first, we haven't done a, you know, kind of formal statistical analysis of this, this group yet. So the things I'm about to say are, are just impressions based on the reasons people have given for volunteering. What we find is it seems like most of our volunteers are probably between ages 20 and 35 or so, um, which makes sense because that's likely roughly the group of who's going to be eligible to do this. Though there are older volunteers, and, and I find their stories very touching because they often say, you know, I know this is a greater risk for me, but it might be, you know, more worthy for science and I, I want to move forward and do it. Um, the other thing I would say about our volunteers, um, and again, who mostly in that younger age range often talk about that, that they're in good health, um, they also seem to be, be quite well educated. I think most of them are probably kind of young professionals or have some graduate education, graduate school, things like that. And often a lot of them have um, like a, a medical or public health or biomedical sort of background. And so they're kind of interested in these topics before. 
Um, the last thing I'll say is that there are a number of volunteers, uh, certainly not the majority, but, but a noticeable group, who have military service and, and see this as being aligned with, with that, which I think makes a lot that of sense. That is so interesting. You mentioned hearing some of their stories. What are some of the stories that you are hearing from them? Why are they volunteering? I mean, you kind of explained that a little bit, but yeah, I'm just curious. So one that really touched me, you know, there, there's a number of, of different inspiring stories. Um, and I actually print out, print out that really that kind of read some of them kind of randomly and, and print out some of the ones that, that really uh, connect with me. Um, one that, that um, uh, made, made me cry when I read it was someone who had been in an accident um, when, uh, a few years ago uh, that had, they, they had lost part of their leg. Um, and it really, really affected their life and really, really hurt their life. And they said they wanted, you know, they didn't, they, they knew that, that, you know, maybe um, they, they'd be ineligible because of, because of this or because they were a bit older. Um, but they, they really just were, were completely passionate about doing this because they wanted to be useful. They wanted to be making a difference. And the, this person had a 13-year-old daughter and wanted to do it oh, for her. Wow. And so that, that was one that, that wow. really touched me. That is touching. So... I'm just, how much of a health risk are these volunteers realistically being exposed to? Mm -hmm. So, you know, one thing I'll say, and, and one of the, the things that's um, daunting about this and, and makes it, you know, a significant decision is there's some real uncertainty. You know, it's a very new disease. We're learning new things every day. And hopefully we'll learn more, you know, by the, the time that it happens. Um, but our best available data um, is that if you look at people ages 20 to 29, um, basically the risk of um, death in that group from COVID-19 is about one in 3,000. Uh, and that's including both people with, uh, who are healthy and who have pre-existing conditions. And so, if you, and so with a challenge trial, you'd be removing people who have pre-existing conditions. And so that, um, if you look at, for example, the statistics from New York City, uh, you know, deaths between people uh, 18 and 45, Something over 80% of those deaths are people with pre-existing conditions. So the risks are, are, are real, um, but by comparison, about 1.5 in 10,000 women die during pregnancy. Um, so this is, is kind of, I think, roughly on par with that. So significant, but also, you know, when, when people are pregnant, we don't think like, oh, I better, you know, say goodbye, my goodbyes because, you That's know, you right. might, might not be here. So it's, it's real. Um, but it's it's also you know within a level of risk that we accept mm -hmm. in other And if the trial is successful, will there possibly be some testing done on volunteer healthcare workers to put you know those that are basically in a higher risk category to put them into a higher risk testing phase, so to speak? Yeah. So there's a few different ways you could you could do this. You could select people for the trials based on people who had high risk before, like a healthcare worker or like someone who was in a, an area with, with uh, widespread disease. So that's one thing that you could do. Um, another thing, you know, is, is, you know, that's an alternative people have proposed to challenge trials, and I think it's a useful thing to be doing either way, is to conduct some of these clinical trials among healthcare workers. So for example, there's actually a phase three trial now of a, a tuberculosis vaccine that they're trying to see if it works for COVID as well. And that's being tested in about 5,500 healthcare workers in Australia and the Netherlands. Um, to be clear, that's not a, a challenge trial, that's a, a mm -hmm. more conventional trial. Now, some are suggesting that intentionally infecting healthcare or healthy volunteers rather with low doses of the COVID-19 virus could help create herd immunity which could potentially make the pandemic easier to manage. So what are your thoughts on this? I think of that as a very separate um, proposal to, to what we're saying, and, and I don't really have particularly intelligent <laughs> thoughts. What, what we're describing is, is something that um, is testing a vaccine and is being done you know, by medical professionals with the, the highest standard of care um, with an enormous amount of preparation. Um, the, you know, the, I haven't seen anything like that among uh, the other approach of, of trying to get immunity or things like that. Um, so I just see them as, as very, very separate. Okay. And ideas. how are volunteers, how are you finding the volunteers? You mentioned earlier that they're actually finding you, right? Right. Yeah. And, and, I'll, and I'll say that, you know, we, we're described sometimes as a group that recruits volunteers, but I don't think that's quite right um, because it's not, you know, we're not trying to, to make a hard sell to people and say, hey, you should, you should do this. We think that it's something that, that some people feel feel called to do and feel inspired to do. And, and that's the way I felt about it. 
And so I think you know people hear about us, and, and some people want to want to sign up, um, and that's how people have been finding us. Our job isn't to to get to to try to grab volunteers. Our job is to try to represent those volunteers and advocate for them, basically making sure that if challenge trials are going to be useful, we do everything we can to make them happen, while at the same time making sure that they don't happen if they're not going to be helpful um, or if the risks are unreasonable compared to the, the benefits. So we're, we're trying to advocate for those volunteers, but we're, our goal is not necessarily to, to try to get as many people as possible to do this. We think it's something that, that if it feels like the right decision, mm -hmm. that's wonderful. And if it doesn't, it's certainly not for everyone. We would never, you know, try to, try to you know. Uh, of course. Uh, right. Yeah. Thank you for clearing that up too. Uh, Josh Morrison, thank you so much for being on our show. We really appreciate the information here. All right. Thank you for having me. All right. That is Josh Morrison. He is one of the team leaders with One Day Sooner. Yes, these giant solar and wind technology installations may last only a few decades then tear it down and start all over again. If there's enough planet left. It was becoming clear that what we have been calling green, renewable energy and industrial civilization are one and the same. The newly released Michael Moore documentary, Planet of the Humans, has raised a lot of eyebrows as it exposes some flaws in renewable green energy claims. So it's kind of odd for a progressive like Michael Moore to be getting praise from conservatives and criticism from those who lean a little more to the left. Joining me now to talk about it from Ottawa's Tom Harris, the executive director of the International Climate Science Coalition. Hey, Tom, welcome to Bridge City News. Yeah, nice to be on, Hal. Now, anyone can watch the film for free on YouTube right now. Have you had a chance to review it? What are your thoughts? Yeah, I spent the last day and a half watching it in intervals. It's a long film. It's an amazing film, actually, incredibly well produced. And uh, I really do recommend that people see it because there's a lot of very good points that are made in the film. But at the same time, it's fundamentally flawed. And I'd like to give you an analogy. Let's pretend that during medieval times, there was a town that was, they believed in dragons, okay? And they thought their village was threatened by dragons. And the mayor of the town happened to be a manufacturer of toothpicks. So he convinced the town that you could kill these dragons when they invaded by using toothpicks. Oh, well, just like in the story, you know, the emperor's no cl new clothes, a child finally pointed out that, well, toothpicks aren't really a great weapon to use against dragons. They don't work at all. Well, in this movie, Michael Moore is the child, okay? He's saying that you can't stop the climate crisis with wind and solar power. And he's quite right that you can't have a significant effect. But he's also like the child because he believes in dragons. Two, two things. You see, the movie is fundamentally flawed in two ways. As I say, it's, it's very good and people should watch it because there's lots of good stuff in it. But he thinks that we're in the midst of a climate crisis. That's number one. And of course, the data shows that we're simply not. That that's you know a fundamental flaw. But the other thing he says is that capitalism is the root of all evil when it comes to protecting the environment. And yet, if you look at the historical record, it's the socialist countries that, in fact, have the worst environmental records. When the Soviet Union fell and we finally saw what was going on inside there, we found that, in fact, they had terrible environmental degradation. You see, when a society is wealthy enough and it's found, founded on free market principles, we protect the environment a lot better. So Moore, it's interesting, he's like the child in this story in that he believes in dragons. He believes that we're causing dangerous climate change, which is not founded. But also he believes that capitalism is the problem. Whereas in fact, it is the solution if you compare it with other forms of government. So the climate change movement often makes claims that renewable green energy is the only viable solution and that fossil fuels need to be replaced. But the film argues that green energy is in fact largely dependent upon fossil fuels, including solar power. Tell me a bit more about yeah. that. Yeah, exactly. Well, first of all, you have to make these wind turbines and solar uh, stations. You know, you have to make the panels and everything else. China is the biggest producer of solar panels in the world and their environmental conditions are absolutely terrible. Okay, so when you're producing a wind turbine or a solar panel in China, China also has the biggest wind turbine company, their environmental controls are absolutely horrible. 
The other point is that, so, so indeed, when you're making a wind turbine in China, for example, coal is your source of electricity for a lot of the refining. But, but also think about it. I mean, a wind turbine only operates when the wind is operating in a certain range. If it's too slow, of course, the turbine doesn't turn. If it's too fast, they have to feather the turbine, otherwise it'll break the blades. So what happens at times when the wind turbine's not working? You need a backup. And as Robert Kennedy Jr. said himself, he said, when you're building wind turbines, you're really building natural gas stations. And you use just about as much natural gas or whatever the backup is in fossil fuels as if you just simply ran them for the main energy source. Because you think about it, if you were to drive your car down the road and drive it 60 miles an hour, then two, then eight miles an hour, then 100, you'd have terrible efficiency for your gas consumption. And of course, you produce a lot more pollution. The same thing with these um, gas plants that have to back up wind turbines. You're only using them when you need them. So they're going up and down and up and down. And, you know, so, so the same thing with solar, too. I mean, when it's not sunny, you know, they say, oh, we're going to use batteries. Well, I'd like to read to you something that's in the MIT review. They're saying here that um, GE recently sold the first of a new line of hybrid wind turbines that come with a battery attached. <laughs> the turbine's battery can store the equivalent of less than one minute of the turbines operating at full power, <laughs> one minute. <laughs> but then they go on to say, but by pairing the battery with advanced wind forecasting algorithms, wind farm operators could guarantee a certain amount of power output for up to an hour. Tom, some of the challenges of wind turbines is the fact that it does kill many birds and bats. And some studies have also shown that they also increase noise pollution. Yes, that's exactly right. In fact, it's interesting. I was in Spain at the uh, Conference of the Parties for the climate change uh, event back in December. And uh, it turns out that the Spanish Ornithological Society calculates that on average, their turbines, and they have thousands of tur industrial wind turbines, they kill 200 birds per year and 400 bats per year. So if you do the arithmetic, what you find out is that between 6 and 18 million, it's a very vague thing because they can't count them all, but 6 to 18 million birds and bats are killed per year in Spain alone. And if you look at the Altamont Pass in California, they've killed thousands of golden eagles since they launched that wind farm in the 1980s. And you know, it's interesting because in the US, the wind farms kill so many birds that the government gives them a kill permit. Okay, a kill permit, which allows them to kill a certain number of endangered species. So the idea that they're environmentally friendly, I mean, that, that's ridiculous. Now, I'd like to read, to answer the question about wind uh, noises, it's an interesting quote here from a lady by the name of Sherry Lang. She's the CEO of the North American Platform Against Wind Power. And here's what she says about the noise. More than just audible sound, grinding, whomping, blade pass whooshes, an ever-present hum. Industrial wind turbines have a silent, below audible impact. They call that um, infrasound. It's not like a daily contamination or harm at work where people can go home at night for relief. With industrial wind projects literally engulfing their homes in rural areas, there's no or little escape. So, I mean, this infrasound, you know, they just come right through the wall. It's low frequency sound. It's very, very bad for you. So nobody wants to live near a turbine like that. And of course, your property value goes right down. Now, because wind and solar energy is not consistent, we chatted a bit about that earlier, because it's not always sunny, it's not always windy, we need something to store that energy. And that means, which you also touched on earlier, batteries. But how do we produce batteries? What are they actually made out of? Well, the car batteries, for example, are made out of lithium ion and they could lithium ion batteries and they're made out of lithium. And you have to ask yourself, well, where does that lithium come from? <laughs> like the rare earth elements that are used in wind turbines, for example, the lithium is mostly mined in China and Africa under incredibly bad conditions. And in fact, they're all often using child labor and uh, virtually no health and safety and environmental regulations. So yeah, you can make batteries, but as I said earlier, they give you virtually no benefit for any length of time, but they're also made under extremely bad environmental conditions. How long do the batteries generally last though? Well, you know, it's interesting. They're saying that the, the electric cars will last perhaps about maybe 10 years. The trouble is the batteries only last about half that long. 
So we're talking about five years. And the most optimistic estimates I saw were 10 to 15 years. But, you know, if you think about it, the typical fossil fuel powered pl power plant, that'll last 35 or more years. OK, wind and solar, they typically last a couple of decades. But the batteries, they're only lasting about a decade. You know, what's interesting, too, is I have a friend that drives a Tesla, and he says to me, you know what, all the batteries in my car, a lot of batteries in a Tesla, I'm going to have to replace them in five to seven years. That's going to be eight to ten thousand dollars to replace those batteries. There's also the, you know, the economical <laughs> element of yeah. it, too, right? Now, coal plants are actually being replaced by green energy. That's according to the documentary. And it argues that they're essentially being replaced by natural gas plants, another fossil fuel. Your thoughts? Yeah. Well, exactly. And as I say, the, the Michael Moore movie is, is really important to watch because he does make a lot of really good points. A lot of his arguments are right, but he's, he's actually founding it on the idea that we're causing dangerous climate change. And of course, capitalism is the source of all evil. So it, it's weird. It, the movie is both really good and totally misguided. So, you know, but I still, I do recommend people to watch it because he looks at the real environmental costs of wind and solar power. And just like you say, you're not actually replacing anything. In many cases, you actually produce more pollution by bringing in wind power because you have to have inefficient backup plants, which, as I said earlier, actually increase your pollution. Now, the documentary, this is quite interesting, suggests that big oil is actually funding much of the green energy movement, that they're profiting from both the fossil fuels and green energy, which is basically feeding each other. Yeah, exactly. If you have a town and you have a need for electricity, oh, they can bring in wind turbines. That's great. Oh, but they also have to build natural gas stations. So what you find is the wind industry loves it, of course, and the fossil fuel industry loves it because they have to build the backup stations. So indeed, you know, it's they ask point blank a number of the experts in the film, what's going on here? And they say they're lying. And that's true. In fact, they are. And, and the, as I say, the film is, is really exceptional, the way he digs in. And as he puts it, as Michael Moore puts it, what they're doing is they're criticizing their friends. Well, <laughs> they're not particularly friendly towards him right now because he's telling them the truth. Now, biomass fuel is often touted as a renewable green energy source. Can you explain to our viewers what exactly that is and why it may not be as green as it appears? Yeah, biomass fuel are typically things like waste wood. OK, and that is actually a very worthwhile thing to burn, assuming you're not having to ship it for long distances, because, you know, typically when you've cleared a forest, you have a lot of underbrush and a lot of waste wood that can be used for biofuels. And that makes a lot of sense. If, however, you're concerned about carbon dioxide because of climate change, and personally I'm not, but if you are, you don't save anything because whether it's coal or whatever the fossil fuel is, you're obviously generating carbon dioxide. And the same thing with biomass. I mean, if you're burning wood waste, you're generating carbon dioxide. And in fact, if you use the biomass and actually ship it for too far a distance away from the source, you're actually generating more pollution than if you simply burn the biomass on site as a way of getting rid of it. The other kinds of biomass are things like animal waste. But, you know, we have to realize that that's also very limited. I mean, in the movie, they talk about running an elephant compound with elephant dung. <laughs> and in fact, they admitted the when they interviewed the people who were actually looking after the elephants, that they actually couldn't even run the elephant compound itself with elephant dung because there just wasn't enough of it. <laughs> and they're talking about, you know, heating. So, you know, biomass is actually quite useful if you're using the wood refuse. But if you're using the primary tree, as Michael Moore talks about in the film, uh, yeah, he's quite right there. That's a big mistake. We should not be doing that. Tom, the documentary seems to promote the idea that part of the solution is population control. Have less babies, then we don't use as much energy. But is this really a long-term appropriate solution? Well, we have to understand, first of all, that we don't have a population explosion anymore. The forecasts originally from the UN were 11 billion people is where we would eventually peak. But now we're not even going to make 9 billion. And the reason for that is that the birth rate in countries like India and Bangladesh and China, of course, China's less than one per woman, something like 0.7. Um, the birth rate in these developing countries has really gone down as women become more educated. So, I mean, that's really good news that we don't have a population explosion anymore. The idea that we could re re 
you know, reduce pollution by reducing people. I mean, that's really true. But at the same time, what we really want to do is increase their wealth. Because, you know, there's something called the environmental Kuznets curve, where if you plot uh, the actual income of a population versus the environmental degradation, what you find is that the, the degradation increases until you reach a certain income and then the pollution goes down. Because when people are wealthy enough, they care about the environment. And so that's in fact what we should be doing. We don't have to worry about population control because it's already over the population explosion. But what we do need to do is help people increase their wealth so that they actually care about the environment. Now, any thoughts as to what degree this film will really impact the climate change battle? I think it's going to have a very big impact. I mean, the last I looked, it was over 6 million views. And being criticized by your own friends, I mean, <laughs> that's going to have a big impact. And I think what's going to happen over the next few months is that a lot more politicians are going to be quizzed on these hugely expensive and generally inefficient and, and really not environmentally benefic beneficial wind and solar projects. So my forecast is this will have a big impact. Tom Harris, Executive Director of the International Climate Science Coalition, thanks for joining me today from Ottawa. Okay, that was fun, Hal. Thank you. And behalf of all of us here at Bridge City News, I'm Hal Roberts. God bless. Thanks so much for watching.